Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 2.13, New England on the Eve of War. When we left off last time, we were discussing the legacy of Bacon's Rebellion for Virginia. It has been an underlying theme in the past seven episodes and will continue to be moving forward, that question of the colony's place in the English Empire. In the episodes on New York, we saw that there was a demand for an assembly during the late 1670s and the early 80s. These demands are finally met through the New York Charter of Liberties. Begin's rebellion in Virginia again questioned the paradigm that had come to exist in the colonies. We had seen that question arise from the Bacon forces about possible independence in the Chesapeake, something that was very unlikely to ever amount to more than a pipe dream in 1676, though the question was still being asked. Those questions of independence were being asked even before the English occupation began after the rebellion. Recall from last time that occupation was deeply unpopular and really did a lot to make Virginians question their role in the empire. In fact, it is this occupation that would end up being so unpopular that it would reconcile the relationship between the former Brooklyn elites and the common farmers. As we discussed, the transition had been pretty clear for them. Sure, both sides had just been shooting at one another. However, both groups could agree on their mutual hate of the English occupiers. While any thoughts of independence were quickly extinguished in the waning months of 1676, the position of the colonists was clearly that they wanted minimal interaction with the mother country. They wanted England to serve basically as a landlord. They would send a check at the end of the month, and if something ever goes wrong, we'll let you know. Otherwise, please leave us alone. At the end of the day, Bacon's Rebellion marked, for Virginia, the beginning of an identity that was separate and distinct from the home islands across the Atlantic. People were living in Virginia longer now. No longer was Virginia a place that you went for a couple years, got rich, and then returned to the comforts of England, if it ever was. By the end of the 17th century, people were spending their entire lives living in the American colonies. However, that is discussing the colonies in Virginia. Virginia had always been more friendly towards the crown. Recall that they had held out, at least for a while, following the death of Charles I. They had been quick to proclaim Charles II as king, and even after Cromwell forced their capitulation, Virginia would later elect William Berkeley, who had been formerly the king's governor under Charles I, to be their governor once again. This stands in very stark contrast to the New England colonies. In New England, basically from the moment of their inception, they had been far more hostile to English rule. This isn't to say that there was an independence movement in 17th century New England. There certainly wasn't. However, the colonists and the English had very different views on daily life. Even by looking at just those early decades, there really is no surprise when we learn that the civil disobedience that would lead to the revolution would find its home in Boston. In the 1670s, New England was not looking to throw off English colonial rule. However, they certainly weren't inviting the English into their towns more than absolutely necessary. The New England colonies were more than happy to do their own thing, their own way, and any attempt at interference from England was typically denounced as being arbitrary government. The New England colonies were and would remain throughout their entire time as an English property, the first place to call out the tyranny of the home islands. Therefore, when the North American colonies experience a rash of uprisings beginning throughout the 1670s, there should be little surprise that the New England colonies were going to be right in the middle of everything. As we are going to see as we move forward this season, tensions in New England are going to build and lead to several conflicts that will help define life in New England for decades to come. All of this is going to go further to help explain the actual position of New England in the greater English sphere, as well as New England's perceived position in the empire. These questions are going to, in large part, cause tensions that will never fully be resolved and will still be simmering when the colonies finally declare independence a century later. Before we can fully dive into King Philip's War, however, I want to go back and look at some other events going on in the New England colony since the last time we left them behind. While many of the events we talk about today are not going to directly play major factors in the war to come, 
these events combined with the ultimate war are going to completely color what happens afterwards. Therefore, to fully understand the consequences of King Philip's war, we need to look at the general state of New England on the eve of that war. King Philip's war was not an uprising against the crown like Bacon's rebellion. King Philip was in fact the chief of the Wampanoag tribe, Metacom. Metacom was the son of Massasoit and took control of the tribe following his father's death in 1661. If you recall, we spent a lot of time with Massasoit back during our first season when we discussed those first years in Plymouth. We will come back and do a quick refresher on Massasoit towards the end of today, so if you don't remember all the gory details, I'll help you out. For the greater story here, it is critical that we understand the relationship that existed between the English and the colonists in New England. Because while King Philip's War would not be an uprising against the English directly, it is an event that is going to have profound effects on the relationship between the English and their New England colonists. The Virginia settlers back in 1607 came to Virginia because they wanted to get rich. They saw a land full of opportunities and open for their exploitation. Virginia did what they could to remain loyal to House Stuart during the English Civil Wars. Immediately following the execution of Charles I, the Virginians were quick to proclaim their recognition of Charles II as the new rightful king. When given the chance, they were quick to re-elect William Berkeley as their governor after he had been ousted for being an appointee of Charles I. After the death of Charles I, it took a naval blockade to get the Virginia colonists to capitulate and recognize the protectorate under Oliver Cromwell. It is really not until after Bacon's rebellion during that period of English occupation that we begin to see the cracks in the foundation between the crown and Virginia. However, New England had always been different from Virginia. The settlers in New England did not set out with the idea of untapped resources and wealth that they could get, but rather they saw something entirely different. That is not to say that the New England colonies had no interest in material gain. It alone, however, falls short of explaining the reasons for their immigration to North America. Instead, the New England colonies were trying to escape persecution. The settlers in Plymouth had left England because they couldn't practice their religion in the open without substantial risk. Well, they enjoyed their lives in the Netherlands, this presented other problems for the group. Concerned that their way of life was now in danger from the corrupting influence of people outside of their group, they wanted to go somewhere where they would be able to live a life without dangerous corrupting influences, while at the same time being able to publicly worship the way they wanted. Well, such a place does not exist within Europe, North America could provide just that. It was a place that was separated from the rest of the world and the evils it contained. Later, during the 1630s, when the Great Migration caused the population of Boston and the Massachusetts Bay Colony to suddenly jump, it was because Charles I was actively persecuting Puritans. Being a Puritan in England was a dangerous endeavor and was a great way to find yourself locked in the Tower of London. There were fears, fears that weren't without merit, that Charles I was an enemy at best to the Puritans, and at worst was a Catholic sympathizer who was going to attempt to reintroduce Catholicism in England. Either way, the dangers were very real and it caused a mass exodus of Puritans from England during the 1630s. So, whereas the Virginia settlers came for the chance to make money, the New England settlers were seeking a place where they could be free of the persecution that had gripped the home islands. They were looking to create a city upon a hill. It should therefore come as little surprise that within the New England colonies, Charles I was not a popular figure. The New England colonists openly supported Parliament in the English Civil Wars, and indeed a few colonists did go back to England to fight. Few tears were shed when the execution of Charles I took place. When the Stuarts returned to power following the Restoration, the colonies in New England were not exactly thrilled by that development. What follows is a relationship that is tense at best between the colonists and the crown. The last time that we spent time in New England, Mary Dyer and the rest of the Boston Martyrs had just been executed for being Quakers. The death of the Boston Martyrs was not viewed positively in England. The crown felt as though the Puritans had just stepped way out of bounds. 
This leads to a royal commission being appointed to investigate what was going on in New England. Charles II, by this point, was becoming increasingly concerned of the extent of his power over the New England colonists. The concern was that New England did not really seem to be following the program, nor did they seem particularly interested in getting on board. Instead, New England was operating in a fashion that would have given the outside observer the idea that New England was just doing its own thing, separate from royal authority. It was following the Royal Commission of 1664, which had purportedly gotten the colony back in line with royal prerogative, that reports had once again begun to surface that the New England colonists were enjoying unchecked power. By 1673, these reports began coming in from a Captain Winborn. Winborn had landed in Massachusetts in 1673 to reprovision himself. He would remain in Massachusetts for the next three months, during which time he would, to his dismay, view how far off course the Massachusetts colony had strayed. If you recall from our episodes both on Bacon's Rebellion and before that New York, the Navigation Acts had become a truly despised thing throughout all of the North American colonies. The Navigation Acts were being blamed for hurting local economies, as well as making it impractical to trade between the different colonies, something that they had previously depended upon. However, while Virginia and New York would, oftentimes loudly, complain about the new acts, they, for the most part, followed the orders. However, Winborn reports a much different situation coming out of New England. He claims that the acts there were all but completely ignored. Ships would sail into Boston Harbor on an almost daily basis from foreign countries, where they were loaded up with goods and promptly sent on their way. According to Winborn, when he confronted the colonial leaders about this clear breach of the Navigation Acts, the response that he got was something of a shrug and a, yeah, okay, we'll get right on that. Now, this was obviously of a concern to Winborn. He was, after all, a royal officer and was indeed the first to visit Massachusetts since the 1664 group came following the execution of the Boston Martyrs. Winborn would find further complaints in the fact that the settlers in Massachusetts had little interest in doing anything that would not directly serve their own needs. Winborn learned this when he made the request that the Bay Colony send soldiers to help their brethren down in New York, where the Dutch were working on recapturing their lost colony. According to Winborn's report, however, he was roundly shot down on this idea. The settlers in Massachusetts would rather have the Dutch against their southern border. They not only made for a better trade partner than the fellow English colony, but they also posed far less of a threat of getting involved in the business of what was going on up in New England. Winborn, deterred but not willing to give up, asked the colony to impress men into the Navy to assist the beleaguered forces down in New York. The settlers responded to this surprisingly well. The magistrate told the group that Winborn was planning to impress them into the English Navy and that, should they have any grievances about such thing, they could go ahead and air them with Winborn himself. The group of men, now facing impressment, shared their feelings with Winborn and nearly beat him to death in the streets. Luckily for Winborn, his men showed up just in time to save his life. It is needless to say that Winborn was not happy at all with what he was witnessing. The report that he wrote back to the Privy Council was absolutely scathing. In Winborn's report, he spoke of the fact that Massachusetts was following their own religious beliefs outside of the Anglican Church. One has got to imagine that this particular allegation would have already been well known by 1675. By this point, there had already been nearly a half century of time where the New England colonies were Puritan colonies. More concerning to the crown and the furtherance of royal prerogative, however, was the fact that New England simply wasn't getting with the program in relation to the other colonies. They openly defied the crown and ignored the navigation acts. Not only is this an economic concern, as wealth is flowing out of the English empire and is enriching New England alone, but it is a problem from the point of view of the colony's respect for royal authority. Windborne reported that the colony's laws were inconsistent with those of the English Empire and that they were indeed arbitrary in nature. The recommendation from Windborne's report was that the ultimate conclusion to all of this is that New England should be united together as a single colony. Other than being easier to control, it would be economically worth it for the English to consider such a thing. Furthermore, 
Rather than having a corporation running things, direct government would become the order of the day. Recall from last season that one of the major advantages that Massachusetts has is that their corporate headquarters is located inside of Boston. This has allowed the corporation to run basically without any checks back in London. The New Englanders realized this advantage and were anxious not to lose it. Now, I do believe that it is worth questioning our source here. Winborn was an up-and-comer and would, a few years later, become an official agent of the Privy Council. Winborn was looking to make a name for himself, and largely that is going to be something that he is going to accomplish. His work in Massachusetts is going to go a long way towards his personal advancement, and it does make one at least a little bit questioning of some parts of his report. While the New England colonies were undoubtedly playing it fast and loose with the Navigation Acts, and likewise had always been somewhat antithetical to English rule, some of the more direct allegations of Winborne do seem hard to believe. For example, the claim that when they were questioned about the violations of the Navigation Acts, that response of, we're going to do what's best for us, England be damned, does seem fraught with problems. New Englanders had zero illusions about not being on great terms with the crown. They had always viewed England as more of a hindrance than a loving mother country. However, pragmatically, they would have known that blowing off a royal officer like that was going to come with consequences. Consequences that they likely were not going to want to pay. One would have believed that the Massachusetts officials, upon learning of the blatant violations of the Navigation Acts, would have at least fringed surprise at the accusations. With Winborn looking for career advancement, it follows that some embellishment was probably par for the course. Either way, however, the report from Winborn simply reinforced concerns about the New England colonies that the Crown already had. The Crown was not oblivious to the fact that New England was acting as a pseudo-independent country. After all, we know that this was enough of a concern in 1664 that Charles II had to send that royal commission to get a handle on things and to get the wayward colony back in line. Winborn's report would have been equally as concerning to hear as it showed just how far New England was drifting from the other colonial holdings. However, before things can go any further in this vein, King Philip's war was about to break out and plunge all of New England into a war against the Indians. However, it is important to note that ultimately Winborn is going to get his way. We are only a few years away from New England corporate charters being done away with and the creation of the Dominion of New England. That, however, is something that we are going to cover much more fully in future episodes. The point of our discussion here on Captain Winborn is to give an idea of the conditions in New England just prior to the breakout of the war. It is also important to note that King Philip's War and the report by Winborn are completely unrelated topics. Despite that, however, by the time the war is over, it is going to help push those recommendations made by Winborn closer to reality. King Philip's War is a huge stepping stone on the path towards the creation of the Dominion of New England in 1686. The report from Winborn also gives some insight into the already tense relationship that existed between the Crown and the New England colonists on the eve of that war. Well, we can't guess what would have happened without King Philip's War, it does seem possible that there was enough concern by the Crown that, at a minimum, an investigation into the conduct of New England colonies and specifically the Massachusetts Bay Colony, was probably going to be launched. The New England colonies were changing by the time that 1675 had rolled around. The colony had become less of a religious sanctuary than it had been during those early years. Whereas the early Puritans had believed that economic success and religion were not things that were mutually exclusive from each other, the dynamic had begun to change the older generation began to suspect that the younger generation was straying too far from the Puritan church and were more interested in material endeavors rather than their own religious salvation. By any modern context, Puritan New England would still seem like a very religious place. However, compared to what there had been just a few decades prior, pressure and influence from the church was lessening. What will come out of this is a particular brand of preacher who is going to start giving sermons on what happens when you move away from those things that are good for the soul and instead focus on material wants. This is going to play an important part down the road a bit. 
Well, again, this isn't a direct cause of the war. The movement away from religion is going to be used by these new firebrand preachers to basically say, I told you so. This is going to partially explain the dramatic swing back towards religion in the last decades of the 1600s and moving into the 1700s. So, on the eve of King Philip's War, you have a colony that is really beginning to come into its own. They are running a largely autonomous system of government, much to the consternation of the crown. The young generation has begun to move away from the religion that bound the colony together during those early years, which in turn would lead to a rise of a group preaching the dangers of such a strain from their faith. The crown is becoming increasingly dismayed at the situation in New England, as the colonies at least appear to completely ignore standing royal prerogatives. King Philip's War, however, is not Bacon's Rebellion. Well, I get that this episode has largely sounded like I'm setting you up for the colonists to begin rebelling against the crown. That's just not the case here. King Philip's War is a conflict between the colonists and the local Indian tribes. The reason, then, for the long introduction to the issues in New England is that King Philip's War is going to largely galvanize all of these other problems that existed before the war. All of these loose strings are going to be pulled together through the war, and what we are going to be looking at afterwards is an autonomous New England colony colliding headlong into the English crown that desperately wants to get control and force the New England colonists into submission. As we start going through the events of King Philip's War, I want you to do your best to keep all of this information stored away, as it is going to become very important when we try to explain the events that are going to define life for a generation of New England colonists. It has been some time since we have visited with our friends back in Plymouth. This is largely because the Plymouth colony is almost immediately overwhelmed by the Goliath in the region, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Plymouth had largely remained that same insular colony that they had always been. While Massachusetts would experience marked growth and development, Plymouth always remained much smaller. Its population was only around 7,000 when the colony finally collapsed in 1691. For comparison, at the same time, the Massachusetts colony had a population of around 50,000. This is despite the fact that the Plymouth colony had a nearly 10-year head start on the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And for what it's worth, the colonists in Plymouth were perfectly fine with this. They didn't have much interest in growing into a large colony like Massachusetts and liked having their much smaller community just fine. It is in Plymouth that we are going to see the events of King Philip's War begin. So before we jump into that next time, I want to spend the rest of today providing a brief reminder of Plymouth's relationship with the local Indians. We had talked about that relationship between the local Indian tribes and the colonists in Plymouth extensively back in episodes 1.16 through 1.19. However, that has been some 20 or so episodes now, so let's take a quick refresher. Upon arrival in Plymouth, the pilgrims were quick to run into the local tribes. First approached by the English-speaking Squanto, who acted as something as a liaison, the pilgrims were introduced to the leader of the Wampanoag people, Massasoit. Well, Massasoit talked a good game, he was far less powerful than, say, somebody like Powhatan down in Virginia. Massasoit, however did recognize that allying himself with the English would be something of a power play, so he did just that. It is during that first winter that Massasoit was critical in helping to feed the pilgrims. Not only did he provide food, but he was extremely important in helping teach the new settlers what grows in the area and just how to go about growing it. If Massasoit could befriend the English, the hope was that when he asked them for help to deal with his issues, they would be willing to assist. That is, indeed, exactly what happened. Massasoit used his position to solidify his own power base. During the 1620s, he eliminated his rivals, including Squanto, and took all the action necessary to make sure that his place in power was well protected. Massasoit then managed to convince the settlers in Plymouth that a rival tribe was planning to massacre Plymouth and the new colony down the road at Wessagusset. The Plymouth military leader and career mercenary Miles Standish was itching for a fight, and Massasoit had just handed it to him. Standish, along with a small group of colonists under his command, invited the leaders and elite warriors of this rival tribe to meet in Wessagusset. Shortly after the food was served, Standish sealed the room and then brutally killed everybody inside. The reverberations from this were shocking. First, just about everybody who heard about the attack was shocked by its brutality. 
Back in England, upon learning of the attack, there was much fist shaking and warnings that the pilgrims should not be getting involved in Indian affairs. Yet in the colony, the effect was far different. It was an outcome that led to isolation. Other Indian tribes wanted nothing to do with the Plymouth colonists following this attack. The issue here is that the evidence that there was going to be an attack at all is shaky at best. Of all the people who stood to benefit from the attack at Wessagusset, none stood higher than Massasoit himself. The widespread belief is that Massasoit had made up the entire threat of the attack and had basically set a trap for his personal rivals. If true, then the plan worked well and the Plymouth colonists had just done his bidding. At best, the Plymouth colonists now looked to be little more than stooges for Massasoit. At worst, they were a dangerously unstable group that should be avoided. After all, if you got on their bad side, you could be facing your own slaughter like what had just gone down at Wessagusset. The outcome of all of this is that the tribes, except for Massasoit's own Wampanoag people, began avoiding unnecessary interactions with Plymouth. Out of this isolation, the Pilgrims and the Wampanoag people were forced, by their own decisions, into an alliance with each other. This alliance would last for decades, basically all the way up to the outbreak of King Philip's War. Massasoit himself would live until 1661, and upon his death it was his son Metacom that would take over as the leader of the Wampanoag people. Metacom was to take control of a Wampanoag tribe that had been at peace with the New England colonies for the past four decades. He even chose to take a Christian name, and he would begin going by the name Philip. Next time, we are going to pick the story back up and begin looking at the origin of King Philip's war itself. Metacom inherited a peace that was 40 years old, yet the self-named King Philip is not only about to break that alliance, but is about to wage an exceptionally bloody war against the English. As always, I hope you all have an excellent two weeks, that you are staying healthy and staying safe, and I will see you back here next time, where we will begin discussing just what would end a 40-year-old peace and send New England to war. <laughs> <laughs>